during the three plus years that the Lord Jesus was publicly preaching, he did a number of miracles. They were not haphazard displays of power. They were specific miracles that accomplished at least these three things to involving our meeting tonight. Of course, it was the healing of the sick person. But Isaiah had prophesied that you will know when the Messiah comes because these are the miracles he will do. And so the Lord Jesus was presenting his credentials as the Messiah by the miracles that he did. But also, and perhaps more relevant to us tonight, the miracles that he did allow us to see in the physical realm our problems as far as our souls are concerned, and they illustrate for us God's salvation. So for instance, if you were here last evening, my good brother, Mr. Baker, reminded us that spiritually we are blind and that we need to receive our sight. And now there are instances in the Bible where the Lord Jesus opened the eyes of a blind man. So that miracle in the physical realm helps us understand truth in the spiritual realm. So I want to read to you a miracle that the Lord Jesus did. And if any of this sounds confusing or complex, I assure you that it is a very simple message that I want to leave with you tonight. Mark's gospel, please. Mark's record of the life of the Lord Jesus. And we'll read in chapter five. Mark chapter five and verse 21. Mark 5 and 21. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. And Jesus went with them, and much people followed him and thronged him. Now, there are just some word meanings here that are very uh, helpful to understand it. That idea of people thronging him, the Greek word that is used has the idea of crowding around him to the point of suffocation. So if you have ever been driving on the New Jersey Turnpike, when in the vast wisdom of the highway repair group, they shut down not only the car lanes, but two of the truck lanes and six lanes of cars are trying to get into one lane. And you imagine the, the cars crunched together like that. Crunch is a bad word. That all try to get into that one lane. That's the picture here. The crowd now was constricted as if they must have been moving through a narrow area. And the crowd is pressing to the point of suffocation around the Lord Jesus. Verse 25. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years. So she's hemorrhaging for 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus came in the press behind and touched his garment. Now, Matthew tells us that she touched the hem of his garment. Luke tells us it was the border. Notice 28 for she said, and that carries the idea of she kept saying, she was repeating this to herself in her weakened condition. She kept saying, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway, immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing to himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? Now, he knew exactly who touched his clothes. Just as God knew where Adam was when he said, Adam, where are you? The Lord Jesus knew who touched his clothes. But he wanted her to come out. He didn't want her to go through life thinking that she had stolen a blessing from him like Jacob stole a blessing. So he said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, please notice this terminology daughter in chapter two he addressed the paralyzed man and called him son and here he calls this woman daughter remember there's a man standing by his side biting his fingernails wanting to get through this delay because his daughter his 12 year old girl is lying home at the point of death but now he's going to hear that what he felt for his daughter the lord jesus feels for everybody and he calls this sick woman daughter 
Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Now, we don't have time to read about the curing of the daughter, but I just want you to think about what we have read. Whip out your phone and take a photo of that scene. The crowd around the Lord Jesus. The disciples trying to make their way through to follow him. People pressing it to the point of suffocation. And then notice that out from the crowd, you will see a feeble hand reaching out, trying desperately just to make contact with the Lord Jesus. Not to speak to him, not to throw her arms around him and welcome him like Zacchaeus, just somehow to reach him. If you took that picture and you showed it to philosophers or to theologians or to doctors and you said, well, what, what, what's the significance of that? They would, they would look at it and think that there was really a, nothing of, of any staggering importance. But because this was the moment where this woman came in contact with the Lord Jesus, this was the moment that changed her life. And surrounding you tonight in this tent, there are men and women who from this book found out what the Lord Jesus did for them at Calvary and they trusted him. They came in contact with God's truth and it changed their life. So I want you to think then about the moment that changes our life. This passage is going to answer three vital questions. First, why salvation is needed. Second, when salvation is sought and finally how salvation is obtained. So we're looking at a physical healing but what we're thinking about is the spiritual need that each of us has in order to get to heaven that we need salvation now why was salvation needed well in her case it was the hopelessness of her plight she has been hemorrhaging for 12 years she is weakened horribly weakened do you remember what the bible says about us romans chapter 5 and verse 6 says that we are without strength now you're not without strength to do many many things but when it comes to obtaining salvation, you and I are powerless as to paying the price for our sins, as to somehow offering to God some currency, some payment that will allow him to, to blot out our sins so that we can go to heaven. We do not have the currency. The Bible tells us very simply that no one can redeem his own soul or redeem somebody else. That's why the Lord Jesus is not a redeemer. He is the redeemer. He is the only one. He is the only one whose death and blood can pay for sin. I had the great privilege some years ago of having sharing meetings in a tent like this with a, a missionary from Africa named Mr. Robert Niels, a wonderful man, just a wonderful preacher. And he told me about a time when that they were trying to build a, a hall to have meetings in. And he hired him and he wanted to be able to to provide some income for people that he knew were in need. So he hired a man to handle the foundation, to lay the block. He got a little frightened when the man looked kind of quizzically at a level because he had never used a level before. And so Mr. Neal thought I better explain to him. So he said, see this little window here? Now, now, now when, you put the level, when you put the level there, you wanna make sure that bubble is in between those two lines because you wanna make sure that, that the, the course, the row of blocks is level. Now, when you get a few courses in set, turn it this way. Now, you see the window up here. Now, you want to make sure that the bubble is in between those two marks or the wall isn't plumb. So be very careful. Well, you can understand his worry. So one day, one morning, he went to see how, how things were at the job site. And as he parked his car and got out and started to walk across the grass to where the hole had been dug. And remember, the man is laying block. But Mr. Neal hears pounding you can't figure out pounding what 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 is he possibly handling when he got to the hole and he looked down the man was holding the level like a baseball bat and he with all his might he's swinging at the wall and he's hammering it with the level mr neil jumped down and said, stop stop what what are you what are you doing you're, you're going to break the level what are you doing and he said i did what you said he said i put the level up against the, 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 the wall here you know you told me and, and it's leaning, it's not plumb. So he said, I'm, I'm trying to straighten it out. No, 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 Mr. Neal said, you don't understand. The level will show you the problem, but you can't fix it with the level. See, the level will show you the problem, but the level doesn't fix the problem. Now the 10 commandments, as we call them, the law of God, it shows us the problem. See, I read the law and I realize, yes, I have sometimes wanted things that I didn't have. Yes, I have sometimes stretched the truth and lied. Yes, I've committed this sin. 
No, I have not loved the Lord my God with all my heart and with all my soul and with all my strength and with all my mind. So I look at the law and it tells me I'm not level. I'm not plumb. I'm out of line. I'm a sinner. But you can't take the law and fix the problem of sin. We need a savior to do that. And this woman is coming to the savior because she can do nothing for herself. See, she's not only weak, but she reminds us that we are powerless to save ourselves. We have no capacity, by the way, even to hold on to life. We can take all the safeguards we wish, pop our vitamins, look both ways before we cross the street. But the Bible tells us that nobody has power in the day of death. See, nobody has power when it's actually death that's knocking at the door, not just the disease, that nobody has power to hold on to his life. So here is this woman. She reminds me that we have no capacity. In fact, just to borrow from the excellent message of my brother last evening, you remember that the Lord Jesus said, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He can't grasp truth about the kingdom of God. We don't have that capacity. I have a friend, he's now in heaven, but I met him years ago having tent meetings in Iowa. And uh, something about Iowa Christians, I will tell you, you're not in their home very long visiting before they want to tell you how they were saved. And so first time I met Harlan, he started to tell me. I was attending gospel meetings. And he said, I was listening to the preaching and I thought to myself, now, now I can see it all. I, I, I just, I can, I can understand. I can see it all of what the men are preaching, but I'm just not saved yet. He said, do you know, two days later, I realized I can't see a thing. I'm lost and I'm going to need to find out from God's word how to be saved. So we are reminded again and again in the Bible, in contrast to all our supposed abilities and accomplishments, that when it comes to saving ourselves, we are helpless. But notice that her condition was worsening. So whatever money she had. She had gone to this doctor, to this physician, to this man. She had tried whatever avenues possibly could bring her healing. And she was nothing better, but rather grew worse. The Lord Jesus likened us to sheep wandering away. And the longer that a sheep wanders, the farther it gets from the shepherd. Sheep don't turn around and come back. They don't have that homing instinct. They just keep going. And the longer that a person remains in his sins, the longer he's traveling away from God. If there are young men and women in the meeting tonight, could I just tell you that the best time to be saved is right now while you're young. And if I have the privilege of speaking to some older friends here tonight, please allow me to tell you the best time for you to be saved is now. Now, there will never be a better time for you to make sure that when your life is done, you will be in heaven. We live in a world, as I've already said, of increasing danger. And mortality. The psalmist likened it to, to our walking in slippery places where we could take a wrong step and we could die. We could be in the wrong place at the wrong time. I don't think I will ever forget reading an article written by a man in the state of Maine. He was a reporter, so he was allowed to write his own article. And if this was a headline that wouldn't catch your eye, I don't know what would. He wrote, I am scheduled to die this year. I am scheduled to die this year. Started out very small. He began losing weight. He had a slight slurring in his speech. Then he noticed the twitching of the tongue and he went to a specialist. Now he described what happened. He said, after the tests were run, my wife and I sat across from the specialist. He never looked at me and he never spoke to me. He looked at her and he said, Mrs. Kasanik, his name was Richard Kasanik. Mrs. Kasanik, your husband has a disease that is fatal. There is no cure. There is no medication. He has one year if he's lucky. He had amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, better known as Lou Gehrig's disease. He stumbled out of that office that day, that medical office, with just one sentence in his mind. Your husband has a disease for which there was no cure. No cure. This is how he closed this article. I am 42 years old. And I don't want to die. I don't want 
to leave my wife. I want to stay with her. I want to, I want to stay with my three kids. And then in some of the most poignant non-biblical words I have ever read, he ended his article by saying, oh, if I could stop the world from turning, if I could stop the clocks from ticking and make time stand still. He felt he was being carried relentlessly on to a moment when he would have to die because he knew that he only had a year. He described being what it was like at, at, at his last Christmas, at his last new year, knowing that this next year would be some day when he would die. The picture showed him sitting at the head of his table, his wife pouring coffee with children on either side of the table. And then those words, oh, if I could just stop the world from turning, if I could make the clock stand still, if I could just, just make time stand still. I can't. You and I live in a world that is carrying us relentlessly on to the moment when we have to leave it. I am so glad that on a July night in 1966, I prepared for the inevitable moment when I have to step from this world. I got ready for it by trusting Christ. I came to him like this woman came to him. In fact, you'll notice that when salvation is sought was when her money was all spent. The emptiness of her purse that drove her to the Lord Jesus. She had gone everywhere else. She had tried everything else. Now she comes to him. Maybe you've tried a lot of ways to find peace. Maybe you have tried a number of, of things to fill your life and heart. Maybe you have been searching for reality and meaning in life and, and significance. Nobody wants to die and, and, and be completely forgotten. We all want to, to feel that our life counted for something. Maybe you've been searching for, for peace, for happiness, for joy, for satisfaction, for meaning in life. She finally comes to the Lord Jesus. You remember, it was fear that drove the dying malefactor to seek salvation. Remember his words to the other malefactor? Don't you fear God? We're getting exactly what we deserve. This man has done one thing out of place. In other words, he lifted his sight above the crowd. He had just moments before he had been joining them and mocking the Lord Jesus. But now he's thinking beyond that. He's doing some critical thinking and he's thinking to himself in just a few moments. I'm not going to go out and stand before this crowd. I'm going to stand before God. And so he says to this other man, don't you fear God? And that's what turned him to the Lord Jesus. Remember me when you come in your kingdom. If you're familiar with the well-known story that we call the parable of the prodigal son, you will remember it was the famine that drove him home to admit he had sinned. As long as his purse was full and the friends were, were there with him and he was buying drinks for everybody there and the, 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 the liquor was flowing and the pleasures were full, he never thought about home. But when he had spent all and the famine hit, he began to think of all that he had turned his back on. And he comes home to say, I have sinned. Here, it was failure. No one else had been able to meet her need. And so she comes to Christ. So as I close, will you notice how salvation is obtained? First of all, there's a man here. And he's desperately concerned for his little girl. My little daughter lies home at the point of death. She's on the, she's on the borderline of eternity. Please come. And the Lord Jesus says, I will go. And I suppose that this delay must have been intolerable. He, want, he wants the Lord Jesus to come quickly. You, you wouldn't want the, the ambulance that was rushing to help your family member to be held up in traffic. And here, suddenly, the Lord Jesus is stopping. But the man is going to hear what the Lord Jesus says, and he's going to learn that in the heart of the Lord Jesus, there is an equal love for everybody. That whatever love he felt for his little girl, the Lord Jesus felt for this woman in her deep need. And I can tell you tonight that the Lord Jesus loves you. If I had time to make eye contact with everyone who is here tonight, I can tell you personally, this is not religion. This is about Christ and salvation. And the Lord Jesus loved you enough to die on a cross so that you could be saved. And so the man will hear him say to this woman, daughter, my faith has saved thee. Now notice the simplicity of salvation. In Matthew chapter 9, Matthew records her words. She kept saying this. If I may but touch, if I may but touch, if I could but touch the hem of his garment. That's all I would need to do. In other words, she knew that what, whatever money she had and whomever she went to had been completely unable to do. Just a touch <laughs> would be enough if she got to Christ. 
So it's reminding us about the simplicity of salvation. She, she would not, she wouldn't need to know much. She wouldn't need to throw her arms around him like Zacchaeus. She wouldn't need to invite him home. Just a touch. But we are told that her language was not only, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, but her language was, if I may touch but the hem of his garment. If I may touch but the hem of his garment. Now, now we're thinking about the all sufficiency of the Savior. See, just the touch and just the hem is what she's saying. What is that telling us about? Christ is such a mighty savior that the simplest faith placed in him will deliver a soul from hell. I think of a eight, nine year old boy who said to me, I want to be saved. And I said, why don't you go in your room, down on your knees, ask God to show you how to be saved. I had told them an incident that involved Isaiah chapter 53 and verse six. I said, ask God to show you what that means. And in a few minutes, he came back to say, I'm saved because God says Jesus bore my sins on the cross. Now, he was eight or nine. I saw a man in his 80s, close to 90, say he was coming to tent meetings in the state of Maine. And he said to us, you know, I, I, I always thought that I was OK, that I would go to heaven. But every time you men ask, are you sure you'll be in heaven when you die? I said, I, 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 I tremble. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But he kept coming. And then one night he was reading in first John chapter one and he read the blood of Jesus Christ. God's son cleanses us from all sin. And he realized there's the ticket to heaven right there. And if Christ shed his blood to put away my sins, I can trust him to take me to heaven. So after the next meeting, somebody who was with me said to him. Well, what's the difference now between now and, and, and before the meetings came? What's the difference? He said. Now I have Christ. Now I have Christ. Do you have Christ as your savior? This is the moment that changes our life. This is when this woman laid hold of the savior's power to save. Just a touch, just a hand. She was well. Now I asked permission from someone who was here because Gertrude Turner was the sister of our well-known sister, Martha Carmichael. She was born. September of 1931. She was attending gospel meetings in Midland Park in the gospel hall. The preacher was Mr. James McCullough. And on the last night of the meetings, she left the hall. She went home. She had been thinking about salvation, but she still was not saved. So when she went home, she got out her Bible. She was reading the Bible. She was searching for salvation. And then into her mind, there came a Sunday school song that she had sung as a little girl in Sunday school. Three crosses. Three crosses standing side by side. A broken law assigned. Two for their own transgressions died. The middle one for mine. And on November the 21st, 1954, Gertrude realized Jesus went to the cross for me. Jesus died for my sins. So fast forward, please. It's 1985. I've been asked to speak at her funeral. If you're familiar with the Midland Park Gospel Hall, there are two rooms up at the to either side of the pulpit. And I was in the room on the right as you look at the platform. And I'm not the sharpest pencil in the box, so I didn't notice this right off. But I was looking over comments of what I wanted to say. And I saw that the date that she was saved was November 21st, 1954. And then it dawned on me that that day of her burial was November 21, 1985. 31 years later to the day when she trusted Christ, she was being buried. 
when your day comes to be buried, as it will, let's be honest, when your day comes to leave this world, will you have had a day when you personally trusted Christ as your Savior? See, if you trust him tonight, you'll be saved forever. Not because there's anything great about faith, but because there's something great about the Savior. He'll save you tonight just a touch, just a hem, just a simple trusting the Lord Jesus will bring salvation to you. If you have a Bible I'd like to read in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4. <clears throat> nice to see everyone who's come out tonight. Make you very welcome. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. The next Gospel after the Gospel of Mark, if you're already open there. And we will read from verse number 16. Luke, chapter 4, and verse 16. Speaking of the Lord Jesus, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And over to Luke chapter 19. Luke 19 and verse 41. And when he was come near, that is the Lord Jesus, when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hidden from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave thee. They shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. I want to follow with what you have heard tonight. And I want to speak about one word that will kind of encapsulate my message. It is the word opportunity. If you were listening closely to Mr. Higgins, you would have noticed that there was a, a woman with an awful disease. And in the reading of that portion of the Bible, do you know what she understood? She understood that there was a man who could cure and had cured every single disease. It says in the Gospel of Mark, I think it is in the early parts of that Gospel, that when most physicians go home for work, when the sun is setting, that all the sick showed up. And it says this, he healed them all. Every single one healed by this man, the Lord Jesus Christ. But here was a woman, and she had tried different things, as you have heard. And she knew that there was a man who was at a bit of a distance away. But she knew that if she could get to him, right, just a touch of just the garment, she would be healed. She had one opportunity, and quite literally, she seized it. Quite literally. My friend, it says here in the Gospel of Luke chapter 4, really an amazing thing. Uh, I don't have the time to go into too much of what it means, but the Lord Jesus is opening the Old Testament. He's opening the book of Isaiah. He, he's showing that this trajectory, this there was a message that predicted his arrival, a message about the Christ, the one who would be the coming king. And he begins to read. And it's a message that's all about him, this village carpenter. And as he closes that uh, part of Isaiah, he closes with those words that this person who was coming himself, the Lord Jesus, he was coming to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, to preach the year of God's favor, to preach the year when God is offering salvation, 
to preach the year of opportunity for sinners like you and me. Because, you know, the next phrase in Isaiah 61 says this to preach the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God. Now you'll notice he didn't read that. He didn't read that he was coming to preach the vengeance of God because since he came into this world, died on the cross for over 2000 years, we are following Christ to preach that. I don't know what you think of 2021, but this is the favorable day of God. This is a great time, not because of how things are socially or politically, but because God is offering salvation to you tonight. You can be saved tonight right here in this tent. You could come to know Christ and salvation is described like that. It is described as an opportunity, an opportunity, an opportunity to receive Christ. Right. We've already heard mention of Bartimaeus and that blind man outside the city of Jericho. Jesus was passing by. This is your opportunity, Bartimaeus. But the crowd says, no, just be quiet. You know what he said? He kept crying out one opportunity. One opportunity. He understood that this was his opportunity. What we read at the end of Luke 19 was a city that didn't understand. A city that continued to reject the gospel. And I'm not sure how many times you've heard a message like this. I don't know everyone who's here tonight. But they had faced all the miracles. They knew all that the Lord Jesus had done. They knew the sermons and the teachings he had given. And they continually rejected him. And it says he stood over the city and he wept. He wept. Why? They did not understand the time of their visitation. They didn't understand their opportunity. You know, my friend, tonight, this is your opportunity. This is your opportunity. And to be faithful to the God we represent, this opportunity is not guaranteed tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. It's just not. Salvation is offered, it is announced. And the terms God, God deals with is this. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. This is the terms of the Bible. The opportunity is today. There was a preacher uh, from a previous era who used to say this. That the opportunity of a lifetime must be captured during the lifetime of the opportunity. Everyone got that? I know it's a little bit late here. That the opportunity of a lifetime must be captured during the lifetime of the opportunity. And this is not the opportunity of a lifetime. This is the opportunity of eternity. This is not 70 to 80 years. This is forever and ever. And it must be captured when it is offered, and it is offered today. You know, we live our lives that way. Opportunities. My phone service is uh, T-Mobile, and I'm not advertising, but uh, Tuesdays, there's an opportunity, an opportunity to get things for free or at least a discount. And today is Wednesday, I suppose. And, uh, you know, with all the busyness, I didn't load my thing, my T-Mobile, you know, and I missed it. Oh, I could write a great story about everything I had going on, but it's offered on Tuesday, T-Mobile Tuesday, and so many businesses live that way, or, or sorry, function that way. But there are things that are offered at a certain time. Maybe, maybe many of you, if you're anything like me, you live your life. You, you, you plan your vacations. You go on your trips based on when there's opportunities. If I were to ask a congregation like this today here, that all of a sudden, um, Delta Airlines coming out of COVID-19 is offering round-trip airfare to somewhere in Florida for $40. It's only open tonight from seven to midnight. You're just going to sleep on it, friend. You're just going to say, well, yeah, I mean, I think most people, most people would plan a trip or at least take a look. Why? Because they understand that every other place functions, that there is a time and when uh, there's a time when something has to be claimed, an opportunity. That woman understood it. Everyone who has met to the Lord Jesus Christ has understood it. I understood it when I was saved. The day I was saved, March 22nd, it was as clear to me as this. Although the words didn't fall from the sky. It's now or never. I need to be saved today. And if you're not saved, and perhaps you've wanted to be, or you've known about the gospel, 
I just wonder, has it ever come like that? Like even the story uh, that you've just heard uh, of, of the boy who wanted to be saved. Has it ever been like that, that I want to be saved now? Not next week. I don't want to wait till the next meeting or the next series of meetings or, or anything else. I want to be saved tonight. Those are the people who get saved. And they want it today. Because that's the terms God uses. Now, <clears throat> there are certain opportunities that it's okay to pass up. Like uh, round trip airfare to Florida. Actually, when I journeyed here, there are people back where I come from. And they said, you know, you're really close to New York City. I didn't know that. I said, you're very close. You got to see the city. You got to see it. Right? I have to take advantage of this opportunity to go see the city. Now, I think with all due respect, you will understand that if I don't go see the city, my life is not going to crumble. You understand that? I, I am not going to be a awfully disadvantaged person. What they mean is that there is something that you would, it would be great to go see. It'd be something that you should really make it a priority, but it's not a life or death thing, you see. But when it comes to salvation, the word means rescue. And so it implies an emergency situation. So rather than viewing it as an opportunity to get a little extra money, get a promotion, have a nice vacation, strike a, t a, a deal on, a, on your phone app, Rather than viewing it as an opportunity for those things, you should view it more in terms of an opportunity not to get something, but to get out of something. To get out of what? To get out of sin. To get out of going on the way to hell. To be rescued. To be delivered. And so, uh, you know, there are many cases like that where people seize that opportunity. I just heard one today. Um, took place at the beginning of this year. A woman who was drawn by gunpoint to get into a car, young woman. She was kidnapped from her house, just walking outside her house. And the man wanted to use her to rob other people. She would go in and he at gunpoint would take their money. Finally, she was no longer needed. So he popped the trunk and told her to get in. And then he pulled up into a gas station and he said, this is the last stop. That's the end for you. He went in and as he goes into the gas station, that woman had, and as some uh, trunks have in, in vehicles and escaped the little latch on the inside. She understood she had one chance, one shot. And the moment that car door closed, she counted, trying to estimate how long it would take to get from a car door inside the gas station. And she pulled it and she jumped and she ran. Now that's coming a whole lot closer to the opportunity of salvation. It's life or death, my friend. It's heaven or hell forever, forever. Not for the weekend, not for the summer, forever and ever and ever with no change and no return. And so you need to seize the opportunity as an emergency. That's why even uh, the, the, the Jewish man I read about who was caught with the uh, SS uniform, right? Sorry, not caught with it, but he had it. Somehow he had it smuggled into the barracks there in Auschwitz. Do you know the penalty? A Jewish man with an SS uniform? Do you know what happened to him? I think you understand. You know what he did that night? He put on that SS uniform and he walked right out of Auschwitz because he had one shot, one night to get out and be safe. And my friend tonight, you are, you are welcome, very welcome. But I want to tell you this, this is your opportunity, your day of salvation, a day of great favor from God. But tomorrow may be too late. Tomorrow may be eternity for you, could be eternity for me. We believe in the any moment, imminent, return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what you have heard today so plainly in the gospel, what you need to do is do exactly what that woman did. You need to reach Christ tonight. You need to trust the Lord Jesus Christ tonight for your inward problem of sin and be saved. This opportunity is an absolute necessity. 
It is an absolute necessity. It's not like having, like we've already said, not an opportunity to go on vacation, but the opportunity to be free from sin. It's an absolute need. That's why Peter, when he was preaching, said, we must be saved. I was having children's meetings with a man. Maybe some of you would know him. His name was Jim Smith. Very nice man. And he was at the stage where he didn't really need to help with children's meetings, but I guess he wanted to. And we were doing the verse, and that was the verse we used. We must be saved. And he walked up and he said, can I change it? So change the verse. Um, sure. And he took the eraser and he erased the W. We must be saved. And he flipped it around and he put an M. And he had all the kids say, me must be saved. Me. Now that's not good English. But it's good theology. It's you for me. It's not the person beside you. It's not the person in the back of the tent or the person in the front. It's just you. It's an opportunity tonight for you as an individual. I need this. Why? Because if I do not, if I am not saved from my sin, from where my sin is taking me, I will die in my sin and I will be in hell. I will be in hell. You see, the Bible doesn't just describe sin as the things you do, the little mistakes you've made, uh, the slips you've made. The Bible describes sin as a power that controls you. It says that whoever commits sin is, is the slave of sin. That's what the Bible says. The Lord Jesus said that. It says in the book of James that sin, when it is finished with you, not when you're finished with sin, but when it is finished with you, it brings forth death. And so you see sin wraps itself around a person and will kill them unless they are saved, unless they are saved. And through the message of the gospel, as God's word, not our words, but as God's word is announced, there are words whereby you can be saved, saved from the power of sin, saved um, from dying in sin and being in hell. And so it's an absolute must, an absolute necessity, this opportunity. But it's also an actual possibility. You know, you can be saved. It's not that you can be saved because we are such very loving and kind preachers or, or very nice church. But we represent a God who did not come into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That every single person in this tent who is without Christ that you have not been, it's not a maybe so, it's not a, yeah, you can be saved, but behind God's back, there's a, there's a, there's a sleight of hand that's going to be played, and it's not for you. No, my friend, if God is offering you salvation in this tent tonight, he's not offering it to you to shove it in your face and say, forget it. He wants to save you. He would save you tonight. God would save you tonight. And so it's an actual possibility. How? Well, it's very simple. You've already heard it so plainly tonight. This man who was anointed to preach the gospel, this man who came to preach God's favor, the way he did that, how could God, how could God, holy, cannot even look at sin, must judge sin? How can God ever be favorable, nice, kind, loving to us who are sinners? How? It was because in the person of his son, God judged him on the cross. He went to that cross, hands outstretched. The very garment you have heard about that that woman touched. They didn't even give him the dignity of leaving that on. They stripped it from him. He's nailed to the cross. In the sight of the whole crowd who passes by. What's he doing there? The Bible tells us. Christ also is once suffering. For sin. He's being wounded. For what? For our transgressions. Says Isaiah 53. He's bearing our sins. Says 1 Peter 2. In his body on the cross. He dies for our sins. Says 1 Corinthians 15. What he's doing on the cross it's amazing, really, with all the things that we draw out of crucifixion, all the pain, all the suffocation that's happening as he's hanging by the nails. The Bible is relatively silent about all that. The Bible draws a huge 
a bolding and a, and, a, and a highlighting to one word, sin. Whatever he's doing on the cross is for sin. He's there for sin. That's why in the darkness, after it passes, he cries out, my God, my God, why did you forsake me? Why was he forsaken? He who never sinned. He who did nothing wrong. Why was he forsaken? For our sin, friend. For my sin. The Bible says God made him who knew no sin, who never sinned, to be treated just like sin for us. So in case I've gotten too carried away and it's confused you, <laughs> the necessity of this opportunity is this. If you are not delivered from sin, you will be in hell. If you are not delivered from your sin, according to the Bible, you will be in hell. If you want a verse for that, let me tell you the words of the Lord Jesus. If you die in your sins, where I am, you cannot come. That's why this is an absolute necessity. The Lord Jesus, it says, he was delivered. He was delivered, why? The Bible says, for our sin. He endured the full judgment of God for sin. He satisfied God, said it's finished, rose again the third day, conquering sin. And now here's the opportunity. Where do you need to get to? Special church, special preacher, special religious rite? Do you need to say some special prayer? Do you need to have a, a special verse? No, my friend. You need to get to Christ. You need to get to the Lord Jesus, just like the woman you've heard about. You need to get to him. You need to get to him. And maybe you say, as Mr. Higgins was preaching, you know, Jesus of Nazareth, he came down from heaven. If he walked down this tent, I would touch him too. You'll notice in, in the passage he read, it wasn't the touch that the Lord Jesus emphasized. You know what he said at the end? Your faith has saved you. Many people touched him. They thronged him. That's why the disciples say, what are you asking who touched you? Every, everyone's touching you. But no, there was one woman who touched understanding. This is my opportunity. Him. She touched him by faith. Is there anyone here in this tent? And you will reach Christ tonight by faith. Resting in what he has done for your sin. You who deserve to be punished for your sin. The Bible says he was punished for our sin. Resting on what God says, and you will be saved. The last thing, though, about this opportunity that I'll just mention is what we read there in Luke chapter 19. And I'm just going to mention it in close because I don't feel in my own spirit the state of frame to touch this passage for some reason tonight. You know, the Lord Jesus, when he said it, he left. You see, the thing about an opportunity is you could miss it. I wonder if I were to just stop the meeting right now and say that I have come as a messenger from God. And everyone here who's not saved, it's too late. You can't be saved. What would you think? But just follow me for a moment here. If I were to say to you, it's too late. You can't be saved. What would you think? Would you say it's unfair? Why is it not fair? Have you not heard the gospel? Was it not announced to you? Did you not know about your sin? Did you not know about what Christ has done? Was there not reason to trust him? If all of a sudden the opportunity was just closed like that, as one day it will be, just as quick as that, just as quick as a millisecond, it will be done. What would you say? Because you see, a person can miss God's salvation. That's the tragic thing. They can miss it. You could miss it. You could miss it if you don't take advantage of this opportunity. Your opportunity. Your day, as the Lord Jesus said to Jerusalem. Your day to do what? Not your day to show God how much you love him. Not your day to try your best. Not your day to see how much your good outweighs your bad. Not your day to find a fundamental church. Your day to trust Christ. For your sin and be saved your day today wednesday would you take him tonight would you trust the lord jesus tonight i can tell you on the authority of the word of god 
that if you were to turn from your sin and come just as a sinner, and trust the Lord Jesus, nothing else, just him, he would save you in the seat you're sitting. He wouldn't ask you to do anything else. He wouldn't ask, wait for you to change your life. He wouldn't wait for you to say how you're sorry for all the things that you can remember. Just now in trusting him, he would save you. You know why? Because what he did on the cross was totally enough. And anyone who trusts Christ will be saved. So remember, the opportunity of a lifetime must be captured during the lifetime of the opportunity. This is your opportunity tonight, friends. If you're hearing the gospel tonight. And if there is a meeting in the Lord's will, we make you very welcome to come back tomorrow night, Thursday. But please think about this. Okay. Please get beyond myself. Get beyond my uh, homiletical weaknesses. Think about what the Lord Jesus said when he opened Isaiah and said this. Preach the time of favor to the world. This is the time of favor right now. Tomorrow. Too late.